Okay, let's uh, let's get started with uh, with lecture. I ain't, I'm not gonna mess around with that. I thought I'd have a little time to do that before lecture started, but it's uh, it's time to to do this thing. So let's go right into some slides. Chatting with WebSockets. So today we're gonna see an example of an app using WebSockets, and that's right, we're gonna do a chat app. So we, this is a, a nice example. It's a, a very simple example. We all know what chat is, and we can use it to show off technology. So you saw it in 115. You're going to see it again in 116. You'll see it again in 312 if you take that. Uh, chat app, it's uh, just a nice minimal project that shows off all the technologies that we're using. So we have the lecture question for today. We're going to see a chat app in lecture, and I'll show you, walk you through that, and it's in the repo and everything. You can see everything with the chat app. Your task for the lecture question is to build a DM uh, DM app. So build a server, a WebSocket server, that's going to listen for direct messages between users. They'll register their username or the register message, and then instead of sending chat messages like we'll see in lecture, they're going to send direct messages to a specific user as a JSON string, sending the username that they want to send to and the message that they want to send to that user. And your server has to send a message of type DM to the user that they specified to that uh, specific user. So a lot of this is tracking the data structures. When somebody registers, when they send the register message, you have to link that username to that WebSocket. That's one of the big things that we'll see throughout today. Uh, it's a critical for your clicker assignment, and it's important, of course, here for this DM question. And this is the last lecture question of the semester. We're all relieved. I am as well. I can stop making lecture questions every day. Um, this is the last one. So the lecture questions shut off after this one. And then the rest of the semester, we have time to catch up with the lecture questions, finish the last assignment, do the homework expansions, and do that project contribution, which we'll talk about on Monday. Uh, so the lecture question fire hose shuts off today with this last one. And it is a little bit going out with a bang, but if you follow today's lecture, this lecture question isn't too difficult. It's mostly adding the JSON parsing onto today's example and just changing things a little bit. And you can finally catch up. I, I'm finally stopping uh, throwing more stuff at you. You can just uh, get stuff off your to-do list. It's kind of sad. Now, I can still give you lecture questions for some of the lectures, but definitely nothing is going to be due. Uh, but with my slides for the next two weeks, some of them had lecture questions in previous semesters. I could still talk about what the lecture question would be, but there's no lecture questions required for those. Um, <laughs> no need to do it. Well, I could, yeah, it won't be required, and there won't be any auto graders for them, no submissions. But sometimes I might mention, like, here's what you could do if you do want the practice. Um, all right. So, uh, and this is the end of the learning objectives as well. That's why this is the last lecture question. This is the end of the learning objectives. The course, I designed the course to have that three week buffer at the end. So everybody has time to get all the learning objectives done. Since I am requiring all five learning objectives, uh, it, it would be too much of a mess to throw a learning objective in those last few weeks. So the learning objectives shut off. We have plenty of time to digest everything, get caught up, get those learning objectives done so you can pass the class and then focus on your uh, expansions and project and open-ended objectives after that. Uh, and anybody who needs that full time to catch up, you have that time. All right, so last lecture question released, grader is up. Some of you already have full credit for this lecture question. Some of you probably have every single lecture question done already. Uh, with, in, uh, with that, let's talk about today's content. So we're, we're not seeing any new concepts today, but we are going to see examples of the concepts we set out and kind of digest a, a little bit of what we've already seen. Uh, so this idea of WebSockets, message passing, event-based architectures, let's digest all this and see how it all forms a single app with some real functionality. So far, we've just focused on little pieces, like here's how you can send a message, here's how you receive a message. And we saw that in desktop clients, web clients, and the server, how all three of these pieces receive messages and send messages. Now let's put that all together, build a real app. So let's jump right into it. And we have some visuals today. 
that um, this is why I'm excited about today's lecture. I had time to found time to make the visuals um, at the expense of punting uh, homework grading down the road, unfortunately. But uh, uh, so here's the somewhat the image that we've seen that we've been seeing in previous lectures, except they don't have the actor system in here. This chat app isn't going to use an actor system, but we are going to have a chat server listening for WebSocket connections. It can be connected to by either web clients or desktop clients, which is something you can see in the repo that we have both a web client and a desktop client connecting to the same server. The server speaks the WebSocket protocol and it accepts TCP connections. And this is one of the cool things about servers is the server doesn't actually care which type of app is connecting to it, whether it's coming from JavaScript in a browser or a Scala GUI or a mobile app. The server doesn't care. The server is just going to have its API, its way it communicates through WebSockets. And then we can have multiple clients connecting to that. And our chat server is going to make SQL statements to a MySQL database. We're not going to talk about MySQL too much today because it's a topic for... Uh, uh, I did update the schedule, so I have a, an exact date for this. MySQL... Well, there is an exact date, whether I remember it or not, is, uh, is another story. I think it's next Friday. Uh, is where I put the MySQL stuff, where I'll just talk about it. It's like half a lecture, just how to connect to a MySQL database. And the queries, the SQL query language is still the same as uh, as SQLite. But how to connect to a MySQL database is, uh, is one of the questions we'll talk about. So let's walk through this step by step and talk about how this chat app works. And as I mentioned, the, the code is in the examples repo. So if you want to follow along the code, as well as the images while we're doing this. Feel free, I will jump to the code after this and walk through the code as well. Uh, but if you wanna take a look at the code and get ahead um, and get the code and the diagrams at the same time, feel free. So I just wanna walk through the entire process of what this chat app does and how it does it. So when we first start up the server, we're gonna run this chat app. It's a WebSocket server listening for connections on port 8080. Can we use other databases like MongoDB or Firebase? Yeah, go for it. Um, I'm, I'm not requiring any database for any assignments that you write. So if in your open-ended objective, you wanna use a MongoDB or Firebase database, by all means, go for it. Go ahead. Uh, oh, and quick reminder, the open-ended proposals are due Sunday. So make sure you get those in if you intend to do an open-ended objective. Uh, after Sunday, anyone who doesn't have anything submitted, you're doing either a second, um, you're you're uh, doing a second application objective. I have so many names for these objectives, I can't even keep them straight sometimes. Uh, another expansion objective of a homework to be able to get the open-ended objective. You'll be confined to that. You, there won't be another opportunity to make proposals. So at, after Sunday, we can start reviewing the proposals and getting some feedback to you and get you underway with that. So the chat server is going to run as a WebSocket server listening on port 8080. When that server starts up, it's going to make a connection to a MySQL database. It's going to connect. MySQL is running as a separate server service and server on your machine. The chat server is going to connect to it um, and keep that connection open so it can make MySQL, uh, so it can submit SQL statements, submit data, and then retrieve data um, from this database. And like I said, we'll talk about that connection, how that connection is made at a, in a later lecture. Uh, but suffice to know right now that the chat server does connect to a MySQL database and uses that database. Once the app is up and running, I want to walk through all the messages that are going to be passed and how this thing is getting the job done of having a chat, uh, a chat app where, um, actually, let me do this first. Some of you, well, one of you were here. Uh, this app is live on the internet. If you want to go to chat.csesoftware.com, cc-software, I guess I can uh, dump this in the chat. If you want to go to this, uh, this app, when you first go there, it's going to ask for a username. You enter a username, you'll get the whole chat history, and then each new message that comes in. Oh, 
I have to refresh. Then each new message that comes in, you're going to get it as a WebSocket message. So you can open up your terminal, look at all the messages that are being um, that are being passed through this thing. So when I first connect, when I first register, I'm going to get the entire chat history, and then each new message that's sent to the chat. We're going to get that message over a WebSocket. So that's the functionality we want. And uh, where am I? Slides. Uh, so that's the functionality we want. And we want to talk about how we get that functionality in the app. So when you enter your username in that app, the first thing that happens is when you click that button, there's a, an on click event that's. Um, that's triggered by that button press that calls a function which accesses the WebSocket and sends a message of type register to the server. So the servers, the client is going to send this register message that has your username attached to it. So we have a message of type register and the content is a string containing the client's username. The server is going to get this register message. It's going to access the database get all of the messages from the database to get all of the chat history, and then send that entire chat history in a message of type chat history to the client with a JSON string containing all of the history of the database. When the client receives that history, the chat history, they're going to parse all that JSON, render that content as HTML, and display it to the user so the user can see all of the, all of the chat that's been going on, all the chat that happened before they arrived. So this isn't like Twitch chat where you arrive and you only see the new messages. We're going to send the whole history as well so people can see all the chat that has occurred. <clears throat> and and by the way, this is another one of those lectures where if you have questions throughout, please, uh, please ask, because I'm just explaining how this app works. There's no new concepts. This is a digestion lecture, so make sure you're uh, you're asking questions if there's still some confusion. So we're going to go through a lot of details fairly quickly here. I'll try to try to go as slow as I can through it, but sometimes I run out of things to say. It sends the chat history, and the chat history is rendered. Um, maybe I'll spend more time in the code, seeing how we really pull that off. And of course, you can have multiple clients. There's no point of a chat app if there's only one person connected to it. So this is where we have our concurrency in. This chat server can handle multiple events effectively simultaneously. This is where we need our event-based architecture is that we can have multiple clients all connected and the server needs to maintain all of those connections simultaneously. So instead of running our code, this line runs and this line runs sequentially, we have this event-based architecture saying, chat server, whenever you receive a message of type register from any WebSocket, run this code from this event handler. So our event that occur is a client connecting, which we don't do anything with that event for this app, a client sending the register message with their username, and uh, a client sending messages uh, after they registered. Those are the events that we're reacting to, and we're going to have our server react to each one of those events with the functionality that we want. So we have multiple clients, these clients can be desktop users. They can be web users. We don't care. We don't know. We don't care. Uh, we just know that they are um, they are connecting to us. Once they're all connected, any user can send a message over the WebSocket of type chat message containing the actual message that they, they've typed in the chat. The server is going to receive this message and do uh, and run all of the code that it has that's listening to that event. It's going to receive a message of type chat message. It's going to access its event handler. And that event handler is going to do uh, a couple of things here. I feel like, oh yeah. Uh, so importantly, this message, if you look at your messages, if you look at the code, uh, it's, uh, this message does not contain the username of the user. We're only sending the chat message. Uh, the button under the register could be used to send a message. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. You can try it. 
There's some usability and user experience features that I don't really have in this app. Uh, it's meant to be pretty bare bones. So you might, there are ways to send messages without a username. I think you can enter a blank username and things like that. But uh, you might be able to send a message without even registering. Uh, I don't think you can, but I don't know. You, you might. Um, but uh, but just try it. You can find out. So whenever somebody sends a chat message, this is you type it in, type your message in the GUI and click send. That's going to fire off the chat message containing only your message, not your username, only your message. When the server gets this chat message, it's going to look up in its data structures the username attached to this web socket. And this is important. This is what the uh, I'll repeat this multiple times, but when you get the register message, I should have started with talking about it there. When you get this register message, you're going to update your data structures to be able to remember the username associated with this web socket. So you have a web socket connection. When you handle that event of that message, you have a reference to that web socket client, that client's web socket. No, I, no, I just a text box under the register. The text box under register is where you type your actual chat. That's where you're chatting. It's like what you just typed in to send that message on Twitch. That's that's the chat box. So after you register, the register box goes away, and then you're just chatting. Uh, when you get this register message, you have a reference to that socket, and you want to remember that socket is attached to this username that was sent in that register message, and remember that. From then on because when this socket sends you messages you're going to look up that username you're going to look up that username in that data structure that you initialized when they registered and this is important for clicker of course when a user registers and you create a game actor for them set up a game instance for them you want to make sure that game instance is associated with that web socket and that user so uh, so you're not mixing up people's games if you have two users, you don't want them sharing a single game instance, for example. Excuse me. Um, so you're going to, when you receive a chat message is where a lot of the action happens. The server is going to look up that username for this socket. You have a reference to the socket again, because you just, you're in an event handler at this point, you received a message of type chat message that triggers a, a handler to be called. And that handler method, is going to have a reference to that socket. You go to your data structure and say, have I seen this socket before? Uh, I preferably you have. Uh, have I seen this socket before? If so, what's it, the username associated with this? And then create a chat message with that username and the message attached to it. Store that in the database and broadcast that message, that new username and message to every client as a JSON string so each client can render this new message in their chat, in their uh, in their stream, in their chat history. So quite a bit going on. Get a chat message, look up the username, save that to the database, and broadcast the new message to all connected clients. What if it's the first time the WebSocket is being called? Actually, let's, uh, I mean, we can switch to the code real quick here. Just to just so I remember what exactly. Yeah, so if it's not in that data structure that I set up, just does nothing. But as long as I do have a username associated with this socket, then we're going to go through those those steps. Look up the username, save that in the database, save the message in the database, and broadcast that. Um, I didn't update this code, did I? Oops. Um, should be chat message. Uh, I'm not going to try to update that. Maybe I'll update that after class. The deployed version has the chat message. Um, but apparently I'm broadcasting the whole chat history here, which was an older version of this example. So if it's the first time this WebSocket loads the page, a user loads the page, doesn't register, but sends a message, 
they just get no functionality. You have to register a username first. And yeah, here's where I should have a check if the username is blank. Uh, just ignore them. Uh, and then broadcast that new message out to all users in a message of type new message. The example in the repo still says, uh, still broadcast the entire chat history, but just send that new message to uh, uh, the type of username is string. Is, those are just strings. Uh, broadcast that new message as a WebSocket message to all of the clients. Once a new message is received by the client, there, there's JavaScript code with, uh, with a socket there that says on new message, render that message to the screen, add it to the chat history, display it to the user. So those human users can see this new message. Doesn't matter if our code knows about that new message, we wanna show it to the users so they get to consume that new content that somebody shared with the chat. Whenever a user disconnects, I'm going to listen for that disconnect event and the chat server is going to update those data structures to remove them. Uh, just do some cleanup, remove them from that the data structures and forget about that client, forget they existed. They're, uh, they're gone, they're disconnected now. And with that, so that's the let's find where I am here. There we go. So that's the overview of what, what we're accomplishing. Now let's take a look at the code and see how exactly we're accomplishing this stuff. So if we go to this chat server, I want to update this right now. Uh, I don't. No, no, I, I don't want to try to break things. Uh, of course, I can't run this example anyway because I don't have my SQL running. But um, but we're going to have our usual setup. Listen on localhost 8080. We're going to listen for disconnects, register, and chat messages. These are the three events that we need to listen for throughout those diagrams. When we When a user registers... We're going to our data structures that we set up. When the server starts, we initialize these data structures. What I want to remember is the sockets connected uh, linked to usernames. And there's probably a better way to do this if you want to set it up some other way. Uh, go for it, because I do have uh, redundancy in my data structures here. But I want a quick way, given a client, look up their username, and given a username, look up their, their client, their socket. So to go in both directions, I'm going to use two maps so I can have all of one lookup in either direction, no matter which piece of information I'm going from and to. So given a socket, give me their username, given a username, give me their socket. So when somebody registers, I'm going to populate both those data structures with those data, with that data in both directions here. When somebody does register, since I, I have a reference to their socket, that's what I'm using in this, these data structures at their username, which is the message attached to this message type. And then I'm going to send them a message of type chat history with all of uh, all of the history, all of the previous chat messages, uh, which is accessing, going to the database, getting everything in the chat database, uh, appending all those as messages, messages, have a way of transforming into JSON strings. And then I'm going to put all those messages in a list, convert that to a JSON string, and send that entire large JSON string with all of the chat history over the internet over to that user. And we can see that message. It's dangerous to go back here after there's been a lot of chat, but well uh and that's this message here we have the chat history as a json string which represents a json array of objects where each object has username and message attached to it so we have all of that 
uh, all of that information in that chat history message. And then the other messages we're going to send to the clients are these new messages with just a single message that has been uh, has been sent to the chat. Let's see if we got anything uh, anything ridiculous. Oh no, my check didn't work. Oh, I'm sad. I actually have a Zalgo check that didn't work. Damn it. Yeah. I got one check working. <laughs> At least I got someone. All right. Uh, uh, t -t 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 back to the code. Oh, I'm bummed my Zalgo check didn't work. I was, was supposed to remove all the Zalgo, too. Uh, so... Uh, so we're going to send all that chat history, and then whenever somebody sends a message to us, we're going to have a chat message listener oops, listening for strings that are containing the message that's sent. And if this user registered, we're going to pull their username, go to the database to store that message using some good old-fashioned SQL that you've seen in 115. We're going to store that message. And then we're going to broadcast to all users the chat history in this uh, in this one, but this should be you know what we can do this chat message new chat message of send that new message as a JSON string is what we want to do. Oh man, it's going to take longer than I wanted it to. I don't know what changes I made there. Okay. So that should be updated in the repo. Oh no, <laughs> push rejected. I, I'm dumb. That's uh, that's what's going on here. I I did. Sorry about this. I did update the repo. I didn't pull. <laughs> that's my problem. Okay, so the the repo was fine. Uh, I just didn't pull the updated changes. So. Uh, so I'm broadcasting that new message to all users. I feel better about that anyway. I was surprised I overlooked something like that. It's because I didn't. Um, and that's uh, that's really the server. That's most of the server. There's a little bit extra functionality in the database. Actually, no, there really isn't. Is there? Adding the chat messages to the database. Uh, the chat message itself, converting to and from JSON is its uh, primary job. And that's really the server. That's everything the server needs to do for a bare bones chat app um, to get everything up and running. So how do you go about running these Scala programs on DigitalOcean? Can you just give it some equivalent of a dot jar? Uh, we, we can talk about that during Q and a or at some other point in the lecture. It's uh, it's more involved than I would like it to be, I suppose. Uh, but it does involve jars. You package your app as a jar and then run that jar on the server. Uh, one one big question, like to actually deploy this chat app, our app is a WebSocket. Our app is a WebSocket app. Uh, so, but we also need to host the um, the HTML and the JavaScript for this app. So that's where you're going to run into some bigger problems. Just the WebSocket server itself, you package it as a jar and then run the jar on your server. Um, but to also host static files at the same time, you got to do a little bit more work. All right, with that, let's look at the... Uh, with that said, let's look at the front end. Front end, the HTML is really straightforward. It's the JavaScript that's really doing the action here. 
we're setting up our socket connection and when we receive either chat history or a new message we're going to call some method appropriately up uh, update that i should probably rename that update takes the history parses that json builds all the html just puts the username in bold and then the message and adds that to the uh the chat history div in the uh, in the html add message very similar except it only builds one message and prepends it to the chat history so it shows up so new messages show up on top so receiving either one of those messages render it for the user to consume user to see this button the chat button is going to be used to uh, call send message so the on click click is an event that occurs and when that event occurs we're going to run some code which is calling the send message function send message is going to check if registered which uh, the server does this check also if you're registered get whatever you typed in chat blank out the chat and then send that message over to the uh, over to the browser send that send message uh, chat message event um, uh, send that WebSocket message of type chat message to the server and similarly registering uh, get that register message built send that username and then get rid of that entire box that everything to do with that registration box we just get rid of this isn't exactly how we would want to set up a, a deployed app but hey it works uh, it works for our purposes here just uh, just get rid of that so that's the web front end uh, we also have a GUI for this app Ever finishes, if it ever runs. We also have a GUI for this app, which does the same thing, isn't going to work right now. It does the same thing as the web front end, but built as a GUI. Of course, GUI is not something we talked about yet, but next week we'll talk about how to build these GUIs. Uh, but I'll highlight the WebSocket parts so we can make a WebSocket connection. It listens for chat history and new message by having these two listeners and their call method is going to be called. We want to affect the GUI in these cases, so we're going to use platform run dot run later and read the JSON, parse the JSON get the username and messages and append those to the GUI just like we did in the web front end we're just doing this in Scala at this point update chat just getting a single message same thing we're going to add that message to the client and we have buttons which are going to listen to the action event when the button is clicked that fires an action event and we're going to run this code when that event occurs we're going to send that chat message over to uh, over to the server over the WebSocket, and when we register we're going to send that register message so all the same functionality is here we're just building this as a uh, as a desktop GUI instead of a web GUI now if I had my database running the one thing you saw when the stream first started I don't have my SQL installed on this machine so when I ran this uh, when I ran this chat server it crashes because it's trying to connect to a MySQL database server which doesn't exist so if you do want to run this full example on your machine you have to install MySQL when you go through the install script it's going to ask you to set a which is my database it's going to ask you to set a password for the root user so whatever password you choose make sure that password goes right here and then you can start up the app and it's going to connect to that MySQL server I don't want to mess with that during lecture, but once that's set up, you do localhost 8080. But if I change that URL to connect to the WebSocket server that's deployed and out there, 
I can run this desktop client on my machine from my room, or from my house. I can run this GUI, tell it to connect. Oh, I keep doing that. Tell it to connect to this server. And I can get these messages. I'm connected to that server through my desktop GUI. So I get the same chat. I can communicate through this chat and everybody sees that. So this desktop app is running through the internet, it's still connecting over the internet to this server, but I can run this desktop app locally. This is how any networked desktop app, this is how it's working. It's just making those network connections, but not inside a browser. Did I, did I misspell? Oh, oh that's somebody else. Um, I can access that from, uh, from that desktop app. I just changed that URL and you can run your desktop GUI. You can pull up the examples repo, do the same exact thing I just did. Uh, comment in that one line, access, uh, accessing chat.cc software, uh, change that one line, and you can have that whole chat history on this desktop app. So we have a networked desktop app. If you ever wondered how that happened, wonder no more. And we can do the same thing. Oh man, I'm on the wrong window. And for good measure, we could do the same thing. In my JavaScript, if I replace this, instead of connecting to localhost, I'll connect to that network. I'll connect to my server. Oops, that one won't work. So I'm connected to localhost. but I can still connect to that server. That's a live server waiting for WebSocket connections. I can still connect. Oh, I didn't set up enter to submit. I can still connect to that from my local machine. And yeah, I, I do support Unicode characters on this, uh, on this app. Uh, Okay, let's uh, look. I never know where to click on this thing. Thing. Okay, so that's how that app works. Do we have to know, remember JavaScript for clicker? No, that's just provided for you for testing. Just like all the GUIs that have been provided for the other homeworks. You should understand at some level how that's working, but you won't be, like, we won't ask about that during the verification quiz. Can you show the connection between the JS file and the server, how it passes the messages? I, what time is it? I think you sent that before I went into that file, right? Um, if you want to see it again, we can talk about it during Q&A. No, you don't have to write the HTML and JavaScript for the lecture question. You you could. I'd, I'd even say you should for multiple reasons. One, to test your stuff. But two, to see your stuff working. We're At this point in your careers, you're building like legit software. Like This software does stuff that people can use. Just to see your your DMs actually working, I'd strongly recommend doing that just to get it to, to really hit you in the head. Like, hey, I just wrote a DM feature for an app. Like, that that's not something light. Like, there's not too much that goes into it, but it still took you, uh, it still takes almost two full semesters to get you to the point where you can understand everything that goes into it. The code itself, once you know, understand what to do, type in the code, you'll see isn't too much. But to build that feature, like you actually, build, you'll build that DM feature from scratch for your lecture question. I'd write the HTML and JavaScript just to, just to play with it and actually see it working. 
Can two different sockets register the same username? Yeah, I don't really have protections against that. Uh, you know, we, we could prevent that, but I don't. So, oh, one last thing I wanted to show. Uh, chat app. We're going to take a little trip away from you. If you change this to clicker, and I did the bonus objective so I can enter a username, I can play the clicker game. So if you want an example of clicker functionality, go here, check it out, you can play the game. Uh, it, it of course just it saves your game. You just saw me load up my game because uh, I have the autosave feature on there. So if you want to play with that, it's there for you. And what I want to do, maybe I can rip through this in seven minutes, is talk about the architecture for the clicker game and walk through what you're building and how it all works together for your clicker app. So in the document, I say build a game actor build a, it's supposed to say clicker, build a clicker server. It does say clicker, on, yeah. I just forgot on one slide. Build a clicker server, build a game actor. Once you have those two pieces and reacting to messages in the appropriate ways according to the doc, according to, oh, excuse me, according to all the specs of the doc, you'll have this clicker game up and running. So I wanna walk through all the messages that are being passed, all the communication that happens, all the events that occur, and see how this, all comes together to build the clicker game itself. You know, with the chat app, at least I can see you all playing and abusing with the that app. With clicker, I don't get to watch you all playing the clicker game. I'd have to I'd have to build like an admin page so I can see everybody playing. Um, so, so let's walk through this the same way we did the chat app and talk about how the clicker app does what it does. So first, the first thing that happens is we're going to run the clicker server uh, we're going to, um, sorry, the first thing that happens, we're going to create an actor system and we're going to create a clicker server actor, which is part of the actor system, but is also going to be a WebSocket server. So that's why I had this crossing this line here. It's, it is an actor in the actor system, but it's also listening for WebSocket connections to connect to the clients. And the clicker server is going to act as the liaison between our clients connecting via WebSockets and our game actors working inside the actor system. So the clicker server's main job is to communicate messages between these two different environments, the actor system and the internet at large. So we're going to create a clicker server in the actor system. Clicker server starts up its, um, its WebSocket server, and we're also going to send update games messages to the clicker server at regular intervals. And we'll talk about that towards the end once we have all the rest of the pieces here how the update games message works. When a client connects to this, we have our server up and running, so the whole app is up and running. When a client connects, they're going to connect via WebSocket. On the connection event, we actually don't do anything there. We wait for a start game message sent from the client containing their username, very similar to the, the chat setup, where with chat, they were sending a register message with their username. Here, we're sending a start game message with that username. So the server, so when you first go to the clicker app, it says, what's your username? You enter your username, you click the button, that sends the start game message over the WebSocket. Clicker server receives this message, and the clicker server is going to set up that game for that user. When the clicker server receives the game start message, it's going to create an actor of type game actor, it's going to create a new game actor when it receives that message and add that game actor to the system. For this, we're going to, not on this slide. Uh, and then when, uh, so the clicker server has a few jobs to do. It's going to start up the game actor, a game actor for that user. So here, just like we're remembering username associated with a socket for the chat app, now we're remembering a game actor associated with a socket. So we know that this game actor is associated with this user. Then we're going to send an initialized message back to the client. So the client can get all the configuration of the game. What type of game? Is this a, uh, are we using gold with excavators and the like? 
or are we compiling code and using debugging tools? Uh, or is it some, some other option? Is it something that you made custom for your game to make it your own? Uh, whatever it is, the client's going to receive this initialize message containing a JSON string with all of the configuration of the game. How does this particular game uh, work? What's the equipment I can buy? What's the prices for that equipment, etc.? Uh, which is all fully customizable. The clicker server is creating this game actor, which is something we haven't quite seen, uh, but we have seen actor of and using props and creating an actor and adding it to the system. You can do that without a reference to the system itself as well. Here we're going to do it from the, an instance of the clicker server. An instance of that actor, we can create actors in the same system by accessing its context. So we do clicker server or whatever you named your variable where you're storing your clicker server. Dot context is going to access the system in which it it is running. And then from there we can do actor of just like we used to do socket system dot actor of we can create actors inside the system using this uh, this syntax here. And that's going to create the game actor in the same actor system as the clicker server. Because we have this new case where we're creating new actors after we already initialized and set up the actor system. And that's how we're going to do it. Clicker server, access your context, actor of, props, game actor, configuration, username, um, third string that I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Actually, I think I added the third one for my bonus objective is an optional parameter. Uh, and each new client that connects is going to get a new game actor created for them. So I can have multiple clients. Each client is going to have a game actor created for them. And the server has to remember which client is associated with which game actor and which game actor is associated with which client. You have to look these up in both directions. Game actors will send messages. You need to know which client that needs to be forwarded to. Clients are going to send clicks and purchases. You need to know which game actor to tell that to. So we have to maintain data structures to link these clients, these sockets, with their associated game actors. This is a very critical, very important part of the app, of, uh, of something that you have to build. Now, once everything's set up for multiple clients, these clients are going to want to play the game. They're going to send both click and buy messages whenever they either click on the big uh, the resource button or when they attempt to buy some equipment. We're going to get those messages in the clicker server, and the clicker server has to access those data structures, say, okay, I got a click from some WebSocket. I need to know which game actor this WebSocket is associated with and then send a message to that game actor. So we're receiving a message over a web socket, a web a message of type click from a web socket connection, and we need to send a message of type click in the actor system. Capital C, lowercase C is not a typo. These are two different types of messages. This is a web socket type. This is a an actor type, which will be a case class or sorry, a case object. Send a message of that type click to the game actor associated with that user, and that's how the client is going to make inputs and have those inputs affect their specific instance of the game. But that doesn't get the client getting receiving new information. We need this part, which is going to be update, which we're going to see in a good number of steps. There's a, a good amount of work that goes into getting the updates working. So we already have the update games message being sent to the clicker server at regular intervals. Whenever the clicker server receives that update games message, it's going to send an update message to every game actor. Every game actor gets an update message every time the clicker server gets the update games message. These actors are going to process that message. They're going to get the update message. They're going to uh, update the gold per um, the currency per second based on all the equipment that's been purchased, do all its math, increment the currency, the current currency then create a JSON string with the entire state of the game and send that JSON string with the whole game state in a game state message back to the clicker server. That clicker server is going to receive those messages at you know similar times, but in some undetermined order. We don't know when, 
but we're just going to react to each event. Each time the clicker server receives a game state message from the actor system, it's going to check the sender and look up the, the, the web socket for that particular actor by using the sender as the reference. So look up in those data structures which web socket is associated with this sender, where the sender is the actor ref for that particular game actor. Look up that socket and then forward that game state to the appropriate client. So the clicker server has to route all those things as it's getting the game states, route those to the appropriate web sockets when it's getting messages from the actor system, from these actors. So getting those sent to the right people so people don't have their games all mixed up is very important for the functionality of this app. So you can have multiple players playing your game at the same time. We want uh, as many players as possible connecting to the server and playing the game simultaneously. This update games message is sent at regular intervals. Intervals uh, By default in the handout code, it's 10 times per second. In the, uh, in the deployed code, it's also 10 times per second. So we have effectively a, a 10 FPS clicker game. And uh, and if, you, if you're if well, you watching closely here, there's actually zero game logic that occurs on the client. The client does not actually compute anything at all. The client is sending user inputs and then receiving the game state and rendering the game state. All of the logic is happening inside this actor system and really inside these game actors themselves. Uh, so if you remember from 199 where I cheated at Cookie Clicker, there's no cheating in this game. You would have to access those game actors to be able to cheat uh, or uh, or write some scripting on the client side to continuously, you know, just basically auto-click your buttons uh, to be able to cheat at this game. There's no just setting your uh, your currency to a ridiculous value because the currency isn't even stored on the client, it's just getting a message from the server to be able to update that uh, that display. It's just displaying the information that it receives from the server. And then for the expansion objective, there's a database that'll be added to this. And I'm allowing file IO if you wanna do just a big CSV file, that's fine. Um, but having an autosave feature I recommend having a saved games message similar to update games, but sent less frequently. On the server, I send a saved games message to my server every five seconds. It sends that message, it forwards a message to all the game actors and tells each game actor to save. The game actor goes to the database and saves its, um, saves its current game state. And then when a client connects, if they connect with a username that already has a saved game, load that game and load a game actor with all of that data from that game, that saved game, instead of having them start a brand new game over again. And back to the last lecture question. So if we look at the, what, why? So if we look at these, messages, we actually have a lot of communication going on here. We're getting a game state 10 times per second where we're getting these new game states. When I click, I'm sending those click messages and just getting game state constantly, constantly. Every, uh, every 0.1 seconds should be pretty consistent. It's a pretty spot on really. Um, a couple of millisecond variants looks like. But every tenth of a second, we're getting that new message. That new message. And that message is being parsed and displayed here. So every tenth of a second, this number is updating. Oh, that socket IO doing that. All right, clicks per second calculated discreetly per second or continuously. For example, with 0.5 seconds. Uh, I mean, you can answer that one, right? Uh, so we're updating every 0.1 seconds. It's... Oh, maybe, actually, no, maybe I am misunderstanding it a little bit. So we're updating every 0.1 seconds. We are getting fractions of a second that is computed, or else that would always be rounded down to zero. And we're not waiting for 10 updates to get an update. Um, that would defeat the purpose here. This would still only update once per second, if that were the case. We want this updating continuously. We want this to look a little 
uh, a little better. We want it to look like it's really updating each time. Uh, so we get that 10 FPS on that counter, on that incrementer. And if I go... If I do like more of a... Choose a username nobody else has chose. I do have some... Uh, if two people use the same username and it's possible somebody chose Heartloff. Uh, I do have some buggy features, buggy functionality. Because I'm storing those, my mapping is using maps to map a... Uh, oops, I can't afford that. To map a username to a socket. Or a username to an... Uh, what am I saying here? Uh, a socket to an actor. I'm uh, I'm using maps, so there can only be one key in that map. So if two people use the same username, you just uh, you do kind of break things. It's a known bug. I'll call it a feature. But once I have some income per second, that's kind of an an off number. I guess I can't really. I guess it's always increments of fifty. But we want this to look pretty smooth, so we want that updating 10 times per second to get a nice, uh, nice smooth incrementing. All right, let's. Uh, let's purchase one behavioral test. And we can see now that we have a little bit more off-ball number, we can still get all those increments in fractions of a second.